Welcome back to Biosignaling on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, in the previous set of videos, we talked extensively about the G-protein coupled receptor. In this video, we're going to switch gears and talk about a new kind of receptor. And that's what's called the receptor tyrosine kinase, usually abbreviated RTK. And the classic example that's used in most textbooks for signaling molecules that activate this kind of receptor is insulin, which we all know is a pancreatic hormone released by its beta cells that causes glucose intake into most cells. And the question is, how does the RTK work? Well, first of all, let's break down the name. First of all, it's a receptor. And apparently this receptor has tyrosine residues on it. And it's a kinase. Now, what this, and what this receptor is going to do is it's actually going to do what's called autophosphorylation. Some texts may call this cross-phosphorylation. And so here's what happens. You see here the insulin receptor in the membrane. Now, you see there's actually two components. There's one over here on the right, and then here it, here's its mirror image on the left. Initially, those two receptor units are separate. So maybe the right one's over here, and the left one is over here. They're separate. They're not together. So what happens is, is when insulin comes in, and insulin actually comes in as a dimer, believe it or not, insulin actually is going to probably bind to one of them, maybe the left one first, and then it's going to kind of move in the membrane and recruit the right one. And so initially, those two receptors are separate, but when insulin binds, they kind of get closer and closer together until finally they dimerize. And this is actually a homodimer because both of these are exactly the same. Okay, um, and when the insulin receptor dimerizes, that's when it becomes activated. In fact, that's when any RTK becomes activated. They dimerize in the presence of the hormone or whatever the signaling molecule is. Okay, now when they dimerize, that's what induces autophosphorylation. So what is that? Well, on the cytoplasmic domains of each of these uh, receptor units, the left and the right one, there is what we call a tyrosine kinase. And so what happens is the right one, let's say, the right tyrosine kinase, will phosphorylate tyrosines on the left unit. But then the left one's identical, so its tyrosine kinase activity will phosphorylate tyrosines on the right unit. And that process is called autophosphorylation. And so whenever enough of these tyrosine residues on each of these different uh, insulin receptor units are phosphorylated, the receptor is fully active. Now, what the insulin receptor can also do is it can also phosphorylate tyrosines on other proteins. And the example here is IRS1. So IRS1 is going to come over here and the RTK is going to phosphorylate it. And so you see over here the product IRS1 with several phosphates attached. Now, Without getting too much into the weeds of this, the basic idea is that IRS1 is going to activate another protein, which is going to activate another protein, which is going to activate another protein, and so on and so forth. And they're kind of going to form a chain, a physically connected chain, whose goal is to activate RAF1. Okay? So, here's what we have. IRS1, only when it's phosphorylated, binds and activates GRB2, okay? And it stays connected to GRB2. And then GRB2 binds and activates SOS, which for some reason is called Son of Sevenless. I'm not sure what the origin of that name is, but it's SOS. And SOS becomes activated. Then we have another G protein here, this G protein, which is similar to what we saw in the G protein coupled receptors earlier, but this G protein is called RAS. It actually has a name um, to function, just like in the case of any G protein, it has to have bound GTP. But in any case, if it has bound GTP and it comes in contact with SOS, it gets bound, it becomes activated. And then RAF1, if it comes in contact with RAS, 
RAF1 becomes activated. And so what we have here is essentially kind of the thing where it's like the foot bone's connected to the ankle bone, which is connected to the shin bone, connected to the knee bone, connected to the femur, the hip, and so on and so forth. And so we have a chain of proteins that ultimately are connected and become activated. So IRS1 is the first one, which is connected to and bound to GRB2, which is bound to SOS, which is bound to RAS, and then which is bound to RAF1. And the whole goal of this little chain right here is to activate RAF1, okay? And RAF1 is a kinase. It's actually the first kinase that we come across in this chain right here that's important. So RAF1 can phosphorylate another protein. It can phosphorylate MEC, okay? So RAF1 phosphorylates MEC. You see here MEC come in and it becomes phosphorylated. When MEC becomes phosphorylated, it becomes activated, and it itself is a protein kinase. So when MEC is activated, you see here it phosphorylates ERK. So ERK comes in here, it gets phosphorylated by MEC, and you see now ERK has a couple of phosphates on it. Now, when ERK gets activated, it itself goes into the nucleus, and it phosphorylates some transcription factors. So it's specifically gonna phosphorylate a transcription factor called ELK1, and when ELK1 becomes phosphorylated, it dimerizes with another transcription factor called SRF, and they bind together in a heterodimer, and they can bind to DNA in certain regions and induce transcription, meaning they upregulate certain genes that are involved in insulin type of functions, okay? So for example, what's one thing that insulin does? Insulin promotes the synthesis of GLUT4 receptors in muscle membranes. So perhaps the gene that's being transcribed here is the gene for the GLUT4 channel, okay, for getting glucose into cells, all right? So that's the basic idea. So again, there's a lot of weeds here, so to speak, but the idea is that insulin binds to the insulin receptor in RTK. It causes two units of it to homodimerize, and when they do, they become activated and they undergo autophosphorylation, they phosphorylate their partner RTK unit, and then you have full activation of the RTKs. When that happens, they can then phosphorylate a protein like IRS1, which then initiates a chain of proteins leading to the activation of RAF1. And this chain here in the case of the insulin receptor, which is very well studied, you have IRS1, GRB2, SOS, RAS, a G protein, and RAF1. Then RAF1 is a protein kinase. It phosphorylates and activates MEC. MEC is also a protein kinase. So when activated, it phosphorylates and activates ERK. ERK is also a protein kinase. So when it's phosphorylated, it goes into the nucleus this time and then phosphorylates a transcription factor, which activates it, leading to upregulation of genes involved in insulin's function. Okay, and that's the basic idea of RTKs. And this pathway, the proteins may change a little bit, but in general, it's pretty much all the same regardless of the molecule that's doing the signaling, which in this case is insulin. Now, one thing I'll just mention that's kind of a common thing about RTKs, generally speaking, the molecules that bind to RTKs are almost always growth factors. Um, not always, but a lot of cases they are. So for example, epidermal growth factor binds via a receptor tyrosine kinase. I believe insulin-like growth factor also binds via the same receptor. And mo like I said, most of these proteins in here are the same. Now being growth factors, if you ever had this insulin receptor or any aspect here get out of control, what might happen? Well, the answer is cancer. In fact, there's actually different mutations in proteins within this pathway but actually when they go haywire, you actually get uncontrolled cell growth, considering the fact that most of these things that bind, including insulin, are growth factors themselves. One of the most common proteins in, uh, that's implicated in cancer in this pathway is actually RAS. Now, in one of the previous videos, we talked about G proteins, and G proteins are only active when they have bound GTP. When they have bound GDP, down here, they're inactive. And G proteins, all of them have an intrinsic GTPase activity, which means that if they hydrolyze that GTP into GDP, they become inactivated. Well, like any G protein, RAS has an intrinsic GTPase activity, but it's a little slower than most G proteins. It's not very efficient at getting rid of that GTP. So if you combine that 
already kinetically slow GTBase activity with a mutation, then this RAS is not really ever going to get rid of that GTP. It will eventually, but it's going to be very slow. And what would happen in that case if it can't get rid of this GTP? Well, RAS will continue, continue to remain bound and activate RAF1. What happens if RAF1 remains activated? Then this entire transcription goes up and up and up, and it keeps going and going and going, and you get more and more transcription of all these insulin-related genes, and essentially they just don't stop. And that is one of the pathophysiological aspects that leads to cancer if you have a mutation in RAS. And considering the fact that RAS is not only involved in insulin, but also other growth factors and RTKs as well, you can see why a mutation in this protein would tend to cause cancer. All right, so hopefully this video gave you a little bit of intuition on receptor tyrosine kinases. Um, in the next few videos, we're going to go over the beta arrestin pathway, and after that, we're going to go into some other sort of minor uh, signaling pathways that there's a little bit less material on, so they're a little bit easier. All right, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.